Um, while uh, Meet the Firms Week is a student-focused event for accounting students, the content is available and, and applicable to students, CPAs, no matter where you're at in your career. So we're glad that our friends from CPA Academy are here. Um, let's see. Oh, live attendees. So, John, you may not know this, but if you attend one of our events live, you get, you get cool stuff. And yesterday we gave away a free session with Becky Tress to – um, have a private sort of networking and job search coaching session. That was that was awesome. Two days ago, we gave a winner. We gave someone a uh, Apple Watch. And today, in this session, I mean, this is awesome. This is worth thirteen hundred dollars. So one winner on today's session is going to get a completely free review course from Glime CPA Review. That covers all four sections. That's valued at thirteen hundred dollars. Um, thank you, Glime. Gosh, uh, that means you, if you're on the call right now, there's there's we're, we're, you have about a one in 150 chance of winning this free test prep. That's going to save you some money. Do me a favor. Um, while we're setting stuff up here, you can check out, learn a little more about Glime right um, on their on their page on Accounting Fly. I am. Um, I'm going to pull that up in just a second. So Glime is uh, wow. Okay, so. If you go to our page on Accounting Fly, I'll see that link in a second. You get 15% off Glime's products. You can demo their product for free. Um, they've been doing CPA training since 1974. They have an access to a pass guarantee, full-length exam rehearsals, and this awesome total support structure where there's a team of accounting folks who are who are right there to help you day or night. Um, do me a favor. I mean, this is pretty awesome. They're giving this away. I, I did not know this was happening. But um, go to this page. This is their, uh, where you can meet the CPA exam prep company, Glime. Say thanks. Just go to that page. Go to the comment section at the bottom. Say thanks for giving away a free. One of you guys is going to win a full free section here. Um, of course, we want to thank our other sponsors, Surgeon CPA Review, the AICPA, CP, PCPS, Zero, and Wiley CPA Excel. If you come back at 2 p.m., we've got more drawings. It's going to be more free CPA test prep products, which is cool. And then today's giveaway – all right, last piece of business is um, another little goodie from Glime. I want to send this out to you as well. So Glime CPA Review is going to be hosting next Thursday a very small private CPA uh, exam coaching session taught by Glime professor Amy Ford. She's a CPA. She's worked in public accounting. In 2011, the Institute of Management Accountants named her the IMA Faculty Mentor of the Year. Um, Amy's going to be covering general tips on the CPA exam. She's going to be covering the statement of cash flows. This is open to the first 100 people who sign up for this event. Then we close it. No recordings. You get to ask as many questions as you want. This is worth hundreds of dollars just to have the chance to do this. So the first 100 of you that sign up for that get that. I just sent out the link where you can go to Glime's page and say thanks for the cool stuff. Check them out. And uh, I sent the webinar link on GoToWebinar where you can register for next Thursday's events. That's next Thursday, October 29th, 12 p.m. Eastern. All right. Um, gosh, thanks. Thank you, everyone, at Glime CPA Review. So um, this morning I want to bring in John. John, uh, John Bly is a CPA co-managing member at LBA Haines Strand PLLC. That's 65 staff strong. Um, one interesting thing about John, and I'm going to let John introduce himself, is uh, John's firm has acquired 11 firms in 11 years. Is that right, John? Yeah. Yep. Okay. If you don't talk about that, I'm going to be asking you some questions about that. that that's, that's fascinating, the whole topic of con consolidation. Um, if you're in the audience and you're contemplating where to spend your career, whether you're an experienced professional looking to change jobs, whether you're a student looking to decide where to go. Um, you need to hear John's message. Mid-sized firms, which I, which we consider local and regional firms, they are incredible places to work. They are incredible places to become a partner at. You make a difference in your community. They, it is a lucrative opportunity, and I don't think anyone's talking about mid-market firms on college campuses, or at least they're not talking about them enough. Um, and I want you to know, and I want to put someone in front of you who has an incredible career, who's making a difference, who who's not going down um, – uh, who has a great life, I, say, I would say, inside a, a mid-market firm. So, John, um, tell them why they should love mid-market, why they should head that way and tell your story, you know, your life in a mid-market 
confirm. Um, I'll hand it over to you, and I'll be back for some polling questions every 10 minutes or so. Okay, John? Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff. I uh, appreciate everybody tuning in this morning. Uh, depends on where you are as to exactly what time, so I appreciate it. Some of you who are on the West Coast, I know it's a little early. So why work in mid-sized public firms? You know, the, most of you who are in schools and universities still, they, they focus majority of the time. When you talk to professors or people on campus, they're talking about big four. And if not the big four, they're following that up with McLadry, BDO, Grant Thornton, and, and the large sort of next five or six. And nobody's really talking about the mid-sized public firms. There may be, you know, one or two that recruit on your campus, but you've probably never heard of them um, until they show up on campus. And so why? Why is that? I don't, I don't have a great reason, but hopefully today we'll get some clarity as to why it might make sense to consider a mid-sized firm, why it's a lot of fun, why it's something different, it's not your typical big four experience, why busy seasons are different, so hopefully we're going to delve into all of that today. So let me give you a little background on me. Who am I? Uh, first, I'm a CPA, I'm a CVA as well, which is, for those of you who don't know, that's Certified Valuation Analyst, so that allows me to do business valuations, both for tax reasons and for uh, some audit reasons that are required as well. CM and AA, that's one that I got a couple years ago. Specifically, it's around helping in advisory services on mergers and acquisitions, so that's something that I feel is critical right now in the profession and it's something really critical for the size companies that we deal with. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the next uh, few slides, but that's very important because as you look at the baby boomers around the country right now, they're exiting all sorts of fields and if they don't have CPAs who are qualified to help them out or somebody on their trusted advisor team helping them out, thinking about their exit strategies and what they're going to do, then they're falling short. And then we also offer wealth management services uh, at our CPA firm. So I have Series 7 and 66 licenses. Uh, as you can see you know, from this, I've got a bunch of licenses. I always joke around internally. My team, when they ask, uh, when they decide we want to start a new niche or something, they send, me off to, <laughs> they send me off to take an exam because it seems like it's one of the skills that I managed to retain from college was I was really always good at taking exams. So uh, they continue to allow me to sit when we decide we're going to grow or expand a niche. So how did I get here? How did I get to being a co-managing member of a 65, 70-person firm? So it's, a, it's pretty interesting, I think, and I think it's maybe a path that some of you will head down, hopefully. You'll, you'll start your careers at mid-sized firms, or you'll start your uh, career the way I did at a big firm and sort of end up in a mid-sized firm. So graduated from Bryant University, which is in Rhode Island. Uh, really excited about that. It was just named the other day as one of the top 10 business schools to get a degree from, so a little plug for my alma mater. That's awesome. And then got, got my master's in tax from the University of Denver. I knew that I wanted to really specialize at that point. Um, audit for me was not something that I was excited about, and so really got highly specialized. Instead of just getting a master's of accounting, went right in and got a master's of tax, which meant about 60 uh, credit hours in just tax and no other accounting or management accounting or anything and so highly specialized there. I then had an internship with PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, in Boston which I transferred down to Charlotte, North Carolina which is where I am currently um, and stayed there a few years but what I found and this is where I think it gets interesting I, and we'll get into the meat of the mid-sized firm, what I found was that I really loved working on entrepreneurial style clients. At the time I was working on clients that were anywhere from 10 or 15 million up to 2 or 3 billion in their private, they were all privately held companies. But the companies that I helped that were really small, when I saved them 5,000 or 20,000, they were so thankful that it, to them it meant another Disney vacation with their family, it meant, uh, a, a, you know, a New, a new trip, it meant a new car, it meant things that actually impacted their life. When I was helping billion dollar companies, I, first of all I wasn't dealing with the owner, the entrepreneur, or the founder, I was dealing with generally the CFO or the controller, not even the CEO. And so, you know, when we save them a half a million dollars, sometimes it might only impact their bonus by five or ten thousand and they just felt like it was, you know, just part of the deal. And so I really fell in love with the entrepreneurial spirit and the spirit that my clients had that were that size, who were you know day-to-day -day battling, running a company, dealing with what it's like to, to uh, build a company from scratch. And so 
starting in 2005, that's what I did, really 2004, 2005. And so over the last 11 years, I've done that entrepreneurial journey. I have, um, I have started our firm, uh, started it in the end of 2004, and acquired 11 firms, as uh, Jeff pointed out, acquired 11 firms in 11 years. We've gone from, uh, back in 04, my wife and I working out of our house. She's a CPA as well, a Grant Thornton alumni. Um, and we went from working out of our house to, in a short amount of time, having a staff of about 15 um, within just a couple of years. And that's when we started to really focus on growing our business through acquisitions. Uh, we've done that a bunch of times. And what it has allowed us to do is really focus on our service offering. It allows our people to be really, really focused on what they want to do. And that's where I think the mid-sized firm sort of gets overlooked. People think big four and they think the large national firms and they don't really realize the service offerings that the small firms offer and the mid-sized firms. Um, I've been blessed in the last couple of years to be able to write a book. I'm the author um, of Cracking the Code, which is a book on mergers and acquisitions specifically tailored to how to acquire other firms and other businesses. So. Uh, I do a lot of public speaking on that and have grown our business and then allowed other people to, you know, sort of hear that message and think of it as an alternative growth strategy in a different business model for their uh, for-profit business. Jeff, looks like you might have a polling question, my friend. Yeah, I do. Um, where can we get Cracking the Code, John? Is it uh, available on Amazon? Yes, it's on Amazon or you can, uh, if you want to pay less money, you can go to our website. It's amazing how much money Amazon uh, takes out of the takes out of the, the, the till, if you will, and, and yet they still don't turn a profit, which is surprising. That not is, to get on. That is not to get on. All right, we'll get on the website, Nicole. Um, you can get on our website, which is on the bottom of the, uh, bottom of the, uh, all the slides here, lbahs.com, and um, also you can look at, um, look at trying to connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and Facebook as well, um, so follow me there. Please follow John on LinkedIn, and um, and, and Twitter. Um, I, John, you got a master's degree. It looks like you went, got an MST. I just wanted to know if the audience intends on getting a master's degree in accounting. Um, I'll give you guys five more seconds. Please select one answer, then hit submit. And um, looks like 14% uh, are yes, 30% are no, 19% are not sure, and 35% are already have one. So those of you who are looking to get a master's degree, I'm going to send out um, some cool resources over the chat over the next few minutes, um, including a way we can introduce you to some of the top master's programs in the country, like University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Okay, John, um, I'm headed back to you. We're going to close this out. Thanks, everybody. And, John, you may need to put – nope, you don't need to put it back in presentation, though. You're good. Keep going. Thanks. So then as we did that, we started to look at – what our key focus was going to be when we talk about, you know, the, the mid-sized market. And so for us, it's really been focused on the one to $50 million entrepreneurial business and their financial needs. And so what financial needs means to me is not just accounting and tax, because yes, that's important. Audit's important. Tax is important, but also looking at other service offerings. When you talk about a business owner who's, you know, got five to 200 employees, they don't have an executive team the way Bank of America does. And so they need expertise from outside and they really are limited on their time. And so we want to make sure that we're providing as much value in that sort of trusted, trusted advisor role that the AICPA talks about a lot. And so we've also expanded those service offerings into uh, wealth management. That's been something that's been a big driver for us over the last two to, flat, two to four years is helping our clients because they struggle with who they can trust, who they can uh, utilize to be on their team to help them manage and plan for their future needs. Um, that's been really helpful for our clients. Our clients really enjoy that service offering. They can come to one office and, and deal with both the CPA, the tax, the audit, and the wealth management all at the same time. A recent service offering, uh, I think Jeff and I were talking about this a few weeks ago. I think we're a little bit unusual on this for a 65-person firm, but I think if you fast forward two to three years, you're going to see lots of people follow in our footsteps. And I don't say we're uh, I don't say we're the only ones who do this, but I think it's going to be much more common in the next few years, and that is investment banking. So we do M&A, buy side and sell side representation. Uh, we started that. We went live September 1 of this year, so only seven weeks in. Uh, we went and partnered and, and brought on an investment banker, and we uh, provide buy and sell side opportunities for our clients. When they're looking to exit their business, which is their largest transaction in their lives, 
we want to make sure that they have the right partner on that team and, and hopefully uh, that ends up being us more often than not. And, and it's something that our clients were asking for. As I wrote the book on M&A and spoke on it, it was something that they found very valuable. We, we offer traditional services as well, tax both individual business and estate, uh, audit. The audit work we do is for non-public companies. So for those of you who you know, read the newspaper and read lots about the PCAOB and uh, the, that's the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, that's not a world we play in. We stay away from that work today. Will we be there in a few years? Maybe, but we'd have to get significantly larger. The cost of that business is just too expensive. Uh, when you talk about the PCAOB oversight and regulations. So instead we stay in the internal audit world when it comes to public companies. So when they have their internal audit departments, some of the smaller public companies instead outsource that stuff to CPA firms. And we happen to be one of the CPA firms in the Charlotte market who offer that service. And we're, we are the smallest of firms that do that. So it provides us a real competitive advantage um, because we're not going to compete with the big four and McGladry and Grant Thornton. And so they, a lot of times, will refer us into that work. When it comes to outsourced accounting, what we're talking about here is a little bit different than the historical bookkeeping or write-up work that might be referred to and, and was definitely never taught at my college. Uh, maybe it is now, but outsourced accounting is, is for these $1 to $50 million entrepreneurial businesses. They don't have time and they don't know enough about accounting to, to always have somebody on staff themselves and they don't have accounting departments. You know, they need a bookkeeper, they need a controller, they need an accounting manager, and they need a CFO. But they don't need full time of any of that. They sort of need a, a, a piece, a small piece of each one of those. And so what we can provide in an outsourced accounting model is we can provide a piece of a bookkeeper, a piece of an accounting manager, a piece of a controller, a piece of a CFO. And we can provide that all in a package that allows them to outsource all of their accounting needs to us um, and, it, and it really adds a lot of value to them and they can trust that it's being done and, and sometimes in these small businesses uh, the accounting department can can get a little loose and so it, it gets much much tighter when you have a CPA firm running it um, and then our size so we're we're in three locations now we did a merger last year that almost doubled in size our firm we went from 35 people to about 65 70 people um, our current size is 72 that if you talk full-time equivalent we're 65 as Jeff mentioned we're in three locations Matthews which is a suburb of Charlotte um, Mount Airy and Greensboro one of the other advantages of, uh, of mid-sized firms in almost all markets is commute time can be significantly less. Uh, most mid-sized firms are not in the downtown areas of their cities. And so they're, we're in a suburb. We, we are half a mile from the city limits and 10 miles from downtown. But it allows our people not to have to fight the crowd and you know jump on a train or, or jump on a bus or pay $20 for parking or something like that. They, you know, we're in our own building here, uh, parking lot attached no big deal. It makes it a lot easier for them to, to sort of, you know, commute and saves them sometimes as much as in, in big cities, 30 to 60 minutes uh, each way. And so you add that up over the, over the course of a year or a career and that time can be uh, significantly important for, for CPAs, especially when you consider a busy season. When you talk about the types of clients we serve, you know, we talked about our services, but our niches are usually construction. Uh, we do some not-for-profit work. We do some charter school work, so those are public schools that have a specific charter for, for their business model. Uh, we do some a lot of professional service and IT and software, and then we, we do property management. So we're not doing any uh, financial services, no banking. We do some manufacturing, but not a lot. Um, and so those are sort of areas that we serve, if that helps you think about what types of companies we serve. So when we talk about mid-sized firms and we think about the big four, um, I bet it would be great if Jeff could change his polling question or if we had talked about this before and we had uh, polled just before this, but I bet that none of you would have guessed that there are 44,000 CPA firms in the U.S. because most people only talk about 10 or less. Uh, and, and so and if you asked even most people in college, I bet they couldn't even name 10, uh, the 10 largest. So there's 44,000 and 33,000 of them are sole practitioners, meaning they're uh, one owner and, and one or two employees. And then there's less than 500 that have more than 60 employees. So, you know, there's 
but that still leaves 490 firms you didn't talk about that are really good size firms. There are a lot inside the top 100 firms in the country that have three, four, 500, uh, all the way up to a few thousand. So we're talking really sizable firms that people just don't even know or uh, don't even know exist. And that's really a shame of, of our profession not pushing that down into the schools to, to allow people to understand the opportunities they have. So what's, what are some of the advantages of a you know, life of a mid-sized partner, uh, mid-sized firm? So we're really client focused. Um, different than a lot of the big firms. A lot of the big firms, the big four, are really focused on, um, you know, sort of some of the political stuff that goes on with, you know, I mean, I was with PricewaterhouseCoopers. They have 200,000 people. That's a little different. Um, so very client focused for a mid-sized partner. Decision-making authority. So one of the things uh, I liked about our size firm instead of a PricewaterhouseCoopers and listen, PricewaterhouseCoopers is an incredible firm. I don't have anything bad to say about my time there, but just didn't fit me. And one of it was because when I realized their partners were really employees and not in the way they get compensated, they're certainly compensated well and, and, and are treated as, as partners when it comes to that. But when it came to decision-making authority, they didn't really have a lot of decision-making authority. So many of those decisions were made at a significantly higher level. And, and that was surprising to me. And, and a life of a mid-sized mid firm partner is you're allowed to have a lot of decision-making authority. I mean, for instance, I've helped drive 11 acquisitions in 11 years. Um, you know, there aren't very many partners at the big firms that have seen a deal. And so it allows us to sort of shape our future. And the partners here all have a, a lot of input in that model. Mid-sized partners are very entrepreneurial. What I mean by that is we own a business, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers, they own, you know, 0.001% or whatever they own of the, of the company. Um, and it's really a minority share in, in a mid-sized firm with 10 to 20 partners. You're running a company on a day-to-day -day basis. You're making decisions that don't just impact today and they don't just impact five or six staff. They impact everybody. And so you're, you're more well-rounded. You're focused on uh, business development, you're focused on HR, you're focused on all sorts of different things. So you don't have to just focus on accounting and tax, which is really kind of, for me, it's a lot of fun. It gives a variety of, of, uh, of life and work. Business development. So there's a lot of mid-sized firms that have to focus a lot on business development. The good ones focus on it even more. And the reason for that is because at the big firms, they have an army of sales and marketing people and in a firm of our size, and we're really far out there on the limb of growth, uh, pushing the envelope on trying to grow as fast as possible. We have a, a one and a half marketing people and we have a full-time business development person. So, and 70 people, that's what we have. And, and so the partners have to be very business development minded, which is a lot of fun to get out in the marketplace. I do a lot of public speaking throughout the country um, and that's really helpful adds, again, some variety. From a compensation range, one of the things that, that you know, Jeff mentioned earlier is that, it, you know, it can be good money. I mean, you know, you can make two hundred fifty to 550000 and, and some firms make more and some firms make a little bit less, but that's the compensation range when you look at the surveys and the stats from mid-sized firms around the country. That's generally the, the range you're playing in. So when you're talking about compensation, it's it's a way to, you know, make money but also have to the next bullet point, a lot of life work balance freedom. And I specifically put life work instead of work life because to me life is significantly more important than work and you have to sort of focus on both. And, and when people put work in front of life, it tends to make me believe that they're putting priority on one over the other. Uh, when it comes to life work, it means things like at our firm, we have unlimited paid time off, which means you know uh, take as much as you want whenever you want. Um, and Grant Thornton just made a big announcement on this like two weeks ago, and we were actually put in the same article as them locally, at least. I don't know how far our um, our article fell out uh, on social media, but they they thought they were the only ones who were doing this, and we've done it for four years. So you know, sometimes the what life work balance is really important for people, and it allows them to have flexibility. As I talked about earlier, commute times can be a big difference. I mean, I can be home in ten minutes, so that's really easy for me to see a kid's game or and then come back to work if I have to or, or things like that. They really give you a lot of flexibility. Other flexibility involves um, not having to move the family. Um, I still have lots of great friends that are at big firms and, and they expect you to move in order to work your way up. I mean, every big four requires you to do a, a, a stint in another city 
Um, a friend that makes partner here in the next, I guess he's making partner in six months at PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, has spent time in California uh, for two years. He's been there 15 years. Uh, he spent two years in California. He spent months of his life overseas and now has been moved uh, to California permanently. Um, so uh, from the Northeast. So, you, you know, the, it depends on if that's something you want to do. If you if that's something you want to do, the, the mid-sized firms probably are not your fit. If you want to travel the world, seeing clients, um, it, it's probably not a fit for a mid-sized firm. We don't generally have those size clients that require us to travel very, very far at all. And usually very few overnight trips. Our audit team really only stays in hotels once or twice a year. Um, it's for a week, if that. And so there's really not a lot of hotel travel, even at mid-sized firms, which makes it really nice. It makes it so you can be home every night um, with your family, even if you're there at dinner time. Uh, it allows you to be there, which is really cool. Relationship with the client. So one of the things that's interesting to me about the difference between big firms and small firms is that you become a friend to these folks. They're they're, they are you. When you're a partner or an or a employee at a mid-sized firm, I mean, they can relate to you because you're at a similar size company. When you're at, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers and you're talking to the controller of, of Bank of America who's running a P&L that's, you know, in the billions, it's hard to, hard to necessarily relate to that. But when you can look across the table and, and see somebody who's running a company that only has 20 people employed by it, um, you can sort of put yourself in those shoes. And these guys become guys and girls become your best friends. I mean, I do so much with my clients, uh, you know, on the weekends, at soccer games, you know, you see these people because they're pillars in the community. They help run the small business environment. And so you see them everywhere. You go to their restaurants, you go to their hotels. We have a few hotels in the area that clients always stay at when they're in town. And it really affects their business. And that's what's really fun is you can actually see the effects on the business. You can see the impact you make when you help them save money, when you help them uh, do an acquisition, when you help them exit their business. It's those things that really get me excited in the morning is to say, look, who am I going to help today? Who is going to be able to, you know, be impacted by some piece of knowledge that I might be able to share or a question I might ask that allows them to grow their business and be more successful and impact their family. And then contact at an early stage of your career. That happens, I would argue, significantly more on mid-sized firms uh, because, we want people to learn the business and we want people to, to understand their, their clients in a significant way. And it's not going out and talking to, uh, you know, the, the bookkeeper at the client, it's talking to the owner or the CFO of the client, which is very different than the audit team at Bank of America who goes and sits in the war room and talks to, you know, somebody there at their stage in their career, um, which is a different sort of interaction. John, um, one comment, one question, and we're going to fire off a poll is uh, I see the – you mentioned becoming a pillar in the community, and the, some of the biggest pillars of our community are the managing partners of local accounting firms where I live in Pensacola, Florida. Ron Jackson, Mordo Sullivan, I mean they're on every – they're on the boards they want to be on. They're, they're, they are just true leaders, and you know th th that is a wonderful uh, uh, career benefit, I think, of, of a mid-sized firm for sure. The question I have for you is, and I'm going to fire off a poll, and so I'm going to fire off the poll, and then while they're while they're answering the poll, ask the question. You mentioned increased flexibility, and that's an that's a benefit of a mid market firm. Um, can you talk about how you guys address flexibility? It's a hot topic among job seekers of, of you know what does that mean, and um and so give me one second to fire off this poll, which is, have you guys taken the CPA exam yet? While you're answering, press one button and then submit. We'll give you 30 seconds, but I'm. I'd like to hear John's answer while we're while we're hearing while we're answering the poll question. So go ahead, John. Sure. So the so flexibility is a hot topic. So I can say that you know on average, if you look at all of our folks compared to all of the big four folks, we work about 400 hours per person less. Um, wow. Okay. The average big four person who records their time correctly and puts in all their billable and non-billable is somewhere probably in the 2600 to 2800 range, and we're in the 2200 to 2300 range. Um, it's a big difference, and so that works out to be a busy season. And 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 then you know the, the biggest difference is I hear this all the time from my friends in the Big Four, and I was there, um, you know, but it's been a while. It's been 12 years, 11 years, whatever it's been. Is that busy seasons? There's more busy seasons at, at 
at the big firms. And so there aren't that many busy seasons at a small firm. There's the, you know, February through April 15th. Um, and then there's the, there's a really, really small one. And that doesn't even occur at most firms um, around September 15th and October 15th. And you might work 45 hours or 50. Um, I can say that when I was at PwC, you know, more than a decade ago, uh, I worked 65 hours a week from August 1st to September 15th to meet the corporate deadline. So right. um, it's a big difference. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. Great, great point. Just, and you free to keep going. I just wanted to just throw that in there. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yep. So marketing and business development. Um, for those of you who, who like to get out in the community, like to uh, understand the way business is run, certainly at a mid-sized firm, you're going to have that opportunity. At a large firm, understanding how Bank of America runs, probably if you decide to leave a big four, is not going to help you if you're unless you're going to go to a bank, um, I would argue. And and so, you know, at a small size firm like ours, you can get the opportunity to see a lot of different businesses. Most of our, let's say, first to second year associates touch a hundred different companies in a year. And and so they get to see lots of different business models, they get to see how they run. You know, if they're on the audit, that's on the tax side. If they're on the audit side, they might see 20, 25 companies. And, and so they get to see a lot of different things and they get to, they get to see what makes sense, what doesn't. So but it allows them to quicker impact their clients because if you can start to sort of put the, put the pieces together mentally and don't stop your learning as you finish college, it allows you to, it allows you to put those pieces together and say, look, this out worked for this other client. It can certainly work for this, for this new client that we picked up. And it really allows you the opportunity to build from the ground up, um, you know, with those ideas. And so you, there's sort of business development within your current client base. And there's also getting out in the community, serving on nonprofit boards, helping locally, uh, doing charity work. There's being, there's being out and actually going to chamber events. There's joining uh, construction groups. We have people that are, that are, you know, young in their career and are in, uh, women leadership groups, they're in construction niches, they're in property management groups. And so all of those things allow them to get out in the community, talk to people, and potentially bring work back to the firm. If they don't bring work back, that's okay. It's getting our name out there. It's the marketing piece that really helps in the long term uh, build a sustaining growth model and a, and, a, and a growth continuum for careers. So system and processes. So we're the mid-sized firms, one of the things that's really cool about mid-sized firms is that the, the systems and processes are not something that's set by somebody you can't touch. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, um, you know, the big four have, I don't know how many hundreds of offices across the world. Um, if you're a second year staff member who doesn't like a process that is being done and it impacts more than you, um, it's going to be a challenge to get that process to change. Um, in our world, we believe in continuous improvement. And so when somebody says, look, why are we doing it this way? I've heard of another CPA firm, my friend at another firm, or I learned in school this. We quickly try to apply those things. And so we believe in sort of constant improvement and we get input and feedback and development of processes from our core staff because we don't pretend to know it all. We pretend to be constantly growing. And, and the biggest key to that is to get input from our team members and allow them to have a lot of say in what happens in the future. Because if we don't get that input, we're going to lose quality people. We're going to lose somebody who says, well, I don't know why they're doing it that way. That doesn't make any sense. We shouldn't do it that way. I'm going to go find somebody who's doing it better, or I'm going to do it better on my own. And so it allows us to, to get feedback, change what we're doing on the fly, get better, and constantly improve. Another thing that's very different is uh, developing your skills. So if you're somebody who knows exactly what you want to do and you want to get really, really, really deep in one specific area like international tax or sales and use tax or auditing um, financial service companies, mid-sized firms are probably not your wheelhouse. Um, and when I say mid-sized firms, call it under two, three, four hundred people. When you get over that, you can start to get into that. And if you want something really deep, it's got to be big, you know, McGladry, Grant Thornton, and the big four. In, instead, what I suggest our mid-sized firms are, are wider range of skills. They're, they're significantly more well-developed when we talk about, they know something about HR, something about marketing, something about sales, something about audit, tax, accounting. They have to know all those things because when they're talking to our business clients, our business clients ask questions that aren't just audit and tax. Um, and, and then, what most mid-sized firms call it more than 60% do is in those first one to three years, they allow people to get audit 
tax and accounting experience. And accounting may mean the same thing to you as audit or tax, but it doesn't in our world. Accounting is that sort of outsourced accounting, debits and credits, managerial accounting style that doesn't even exist at the big four. They don't know debits and credits, and that's not meant to be an offense. It's just that they don't they don't really make journal entries except for maybe an audit adjustment or two. Um, and, and we're helping clients on a day-to-day -day basis with their accounting. And so bigger firms want you to stick with your expertise or a specific skill path. And, and at mid-sized firms, you're more well-rounded. You get to sort of choose. And then sort of once you've passed that one to three year mark, depending on the firm, you sort of get to choose what your specialty is, whether that's audit, tax, or accounting, or if you want to continue to do uh, a little bit of all of, all of them, it, it depends on the firm and it depends on the person. But uh, all of those things exist. We have partners who certainly do audit, tax, and accounting. We have some who just do tax, some who just do audit. And so it depends on what they wanted to do and how they, how they grew up in their career and the things that they were really passionate about. And we're encouraged, we encourage people, and, and most mid-sized firms do, to work and see different fields, meaning um, to understand all three of the, of the areas of discipline and our consulting business around M&A or business valuations, or uh, some firms do forensic audits. We don't yet. Um, that'll be you know, somewhere soon down the road, but, but that allows us to sort of expand and allow people to see different things. And what we'd rather do is say, look, what are you really passionate about? And if you're really good at that and we don't have an offer right now, how can we get there in the next six to 18 months? Because we're, we're very growth driven and, and in mid-sized firms and we're very opportunistic and we can turn a lot faster than the big firms can because we're not 200,000 people or 70 people or 50 people or 30 people or 200. And so the ship's not as big if you think about the Titanic. It takes forever to turn that thing doesn't take as long to turn you know, a, a small speedboat, and that's really what you're talking about when you're talking about mid-sized firms. So access. Um, access to key decision makers at the firm level. Um, at a, at a mid-sized firm versus a really large firm or a big four, the partners, managers, and directors, depending on which firm you're at and what they title people, they're sitting in offices five feet away, and they're and they're right around the corner, and they're talking to you on a, you know, hourly basis. I mean, it's it's not something where they're out of sight, out of mind, and they're the ones that aren't just they're not just partners, but they're actual decision makers. And I want to make sure that we're clear today that there is a difference. Some partners uh, at really big firms don't actually get to make too many management decisions. They might get to make client decisions, and lots of them but they're not making management decisions. And so if you want something changed, it might be a challenge or it might take a long time to get something like that changed. Whereas at a mid-sized firm, you can have that access to these folks, the managers, partners, directors on a, on a regular basis. And you get to serve on committees at a really young age in your career. We have lots of committees. We have, a, uh, we have committees on IT, we have committees on audit and tax and outsourced accounting and, and we want you know, sort of first and second and third year people on those committees because they might see things differently. They might be more technologically savvy. They might be more tied to what's changing in the marketplace. And so the more of that input we can get, the more we can change and react and, and, and change things on the fly much faster. And so having that key decision maker firm level access is really important in a young stage in your career because it allows you to watch them in action. It allows you to see how they think about things. It allows you to see them uh, on the phone with their clients, in meetings with clients, actually be there present. I mean, if you're on a if you're on a large audit engagement at a at a big CPA firm, the partner on the engagement probably comes out for day one and the last day of the audit. It might be a four month audit, and and that's for the you know the opening meeting, the closing meeting, and that's it. And you know, in our world, that's just not the case. They're out there on a regular basis, sitting right next to you and, and helping you through issues. And so it's really kind of nice to have that availability and ease of access and at the same time make sure that um, you're learning in your career and that you're developing and that you understand what it takes to get to the next level, whatever that might be. And so um, before Jeff asks his last polling question and, and turns it on to Q&A, I just want to make sure I emphasize it's significantly entrepreneurial, mid-sized partners are very, very entrepreneurial. They're thinking about their business every single day and their business is running a CPA firm or running whatever services they offer within the CPA firm and that's very different than many other large firms are. So um, I guess appreciate your time and we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to Jeff for either a polling question or some Q&A.
Yeah, and uh, I'm going to do a quick polling question, but then just keep the conversation going, John, um, because uh, we have a handful of questions, and I, I personally have a lot of questions. Let's do a polling question real quick. Just to, before this webinar, what was your interest level in becoming a partner at a mid-market firm? Um, I, I'd like to know that because um, I'll tell you a funny story while, while, while we're waiting for everybody to come in. Just select one and hit submit. But I was talking to a college student at the University of Maryland and asked the student, um, what your career plans were? She wanted to go to the big four and then go into private industry. And I said, well, did you ever consider a mid-market firm? You could be community leader. You could make good money. You know, maybe not have the hours of the big four. She said, yeah, I, I worked at one, I, I interviewed with one small firm and it was Cone Resnick. And, you know, you may not know this, but Cone Resnick is one of the largest nine or 10 firms in the United States. So um, that's the level of, of disconnect I feel like we have as an industry between the mid-market and, and who the big four are. Um, but yeah, I mean, so so 34% um, said uh, it's, it's high, but I'm considering other options. 15% it's very high. Um, and I hadn't, and 50% said I hadn't considered it before. So interesting, interesting. I'm going to close this up. Thanks, everybody. Um, John, I, I don't want to cut off the part about being entrepreneurial because I think the mid-market firm is where the folks who have that entrepreneurial whatever, uh, that, that X factor tend to go because, because they're thinking about business. They become business developers. I got to think that you are an entrepreneurial person given the fact that, um, uh, that you're in a mid-market firm and also the acquisitions. I don't know. I, I, I just thought maybe if you could talk about, about what makes a career in a mid-market firm an entrepreneurial career a little bit more, I think that'd be valuable. Sure. So it's funny, Jeff. I certainly no offense to the, to the couple hundred that are on this call, but I joke around all the time and I actually say it as part of my, some of my talks that I'm an entrepreneur who was dumb enough to be a CPA. I say all the time. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I made, I made my career in the CPA profession significantly entrepreneurial. Um, what I look at is, I mean, there, first, it's entrepreneurial because you're making decisions that impact not your line of business, but they impact the firm for the next 20 years. When we're making decisions on a merger and acquisition, they're, they're driving the future strategy and vision and goals of the firm. They're, we're not making decisions that are who's going to pick up the next client. We're making decisions that drive, are we going to be 60 people or are we going to be 500? And for me, that's where the entrepreneurial spirit comes in, and it is running a business, right? We have an HR person. We have a controller. We have a, 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 an accounting person that helps our controller. We have sales. We have marketing. And so for me, being a co-managing partner of the firm, I get to focus on our business model, which is really fun for me. I absolutely am super passionate about it. I love being able to, to think about it as a business and, and not a CPA firm and say, what, are, what do our clients want that maybe we're not offering? And what can we do about that? Just because it's not a historical CPA service doesn't mean we shouldn't provide it. If our clients are begging us that they can't get it from somebody they trust, why aren't we doing it? And that's what I really love about it. I can I can see the evidence of what you're talking about, the fact that you guys are branching into investment banking services. I mean, that is, that's a perfect example of you guys looking at need in the market. I mean, that, that is awesome, John. That is really, really cool. And are, are you... What's your role in the middle of all of that? Yeah, so my role in the middle of the investment bank was to uh, find the right person, help launch it, and then um, be sort of managing director of it for a period of time until it's fully operational on its own. Um, and so I've spent probably 20, 10 to 20% of my week doing uh, investment banking type stuff. We have somebody who's doing the physical work, but I got to do a lot of business development, a lot of uh, shaking hands, getting back in front of the community, in front of the bankers who didn't know we did this, um, in front of other CPA firms who don't do it, that we can say, look, we're not going to steal your client, help us out, you know, and, and we'll, you know, let you keep the work, but help us, help us grow our business. And so it's being out as much as possible, which is something I'm, I'm really comfortable with and I really enjoy. Let's talk about recruiting. Um, you, you know, the, the big four have a pretty amazing recruiting apparatus and um, they, they, they're very strong at, they're, they're all over college campuses and y'all, y'all see it every day on school camp on, on campus. But so a couple of questions about recruiting for your firm and maybe that'll help us understand mid markets in general, but I bet what you're looking for is different than maybe what a large firm is looking for in a, 
young hire or a senior associate. Can you talk about what are the factors you're looking for beyond technical skill in, in people? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, one of the things that we're really looking for um, is, you know, it's great to have a 4.0. I mean, no doubt, but uh, I happen to be somebody who believes that um, with enough time, a lot of people could get a 4.0. And so what I what we try to focus on a lot is people who are well-rounded, significantly well-rounded. So did they work in college? Did they have an internship in college? Did they put themselves through college? Did they also get involved in clubs or did they play in sports? I mean, those things are really, really uh, important because it tells you can multitask and it tells you're not just a one trick pony to use that to use that uh, you know analogy. And, and that's really interesting to us. So if you've got a three, two or a three, one, but you were the president of five clubs or your or you were president of your uh, fraternity or sorority, or you were the captain of your, you know, tennis team or whatever. Those sorts of things mean a lot to us because it shows us leadership ability. It shows us that you have desire to not just do one thing. It tells us you probably have significant social skills that are going to be helpful in business development, and and you probably are really interested in learning new things. You're on mute, Jeff. Thanks. Great answer. I was I was uh, writing notes because I think we need to uh, get that on our blog, and that and that nailed it for college students and hopefully folks who are in college on the call got that. But now let's let's flip it and say you're talking to a senior or maybe a manager type. Um, so they they have experience. They are maybe are moving to North Carolina or they they they've left a firm or left industry. Then where does your focus go when you're evaluating somebody and, and describe that kind of strong candidate at that level? Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the manager because that one's a little bit easier, and then I'll come back to the senior. So the manager for us would be really key on two different fronts. One is if we're looking to launch a new niche that somebody has expertise in. That's you know something we're really deep in. So for instance, we hired a valuation manager recently because we were growing that practice really strong, and we couldn't afford to have somebody who didn't have a ton of expertise in it already. So that was really a focus for us. Um, when we're looking at a senior, what we're looking for is somebody who's burned out on the Big Four or the or the McGladry Grant Thornton, and, and really, uh, you know, your, your joke on Cone Resnick is really funny because they are huge. They're not a mid-sized firm. That's not they a small are, firm. <laughs> oh, yeah. With whatever they have, two thousand people or something. Um, so, <laughs> so they're um, we're looking for somebody who's burned out but loves to serve clients and is interested in something different. Uh, they're maybe interested in a different lifestyle, or they're interested in making an impact on the on the client's business, not just their uh, taxes. And they're maybe they have that entrepreneurial itch, and they're just not sure where to get it scratched. And a mid-sized firm um, could be the great opportunity for them. Uh, I agree. Um, and do you guys you guys go on campus, right, and hire college students? Okay. Yeah, we actually. Just got the news yesterday that we got, uh, I think, two or three interns have accepted our, our uh, offers for the spring, so I'm excited about that. Yeah, we go on campus to, I think it's three or four campuses in the total in our total market space, and I'll tell you, I'll be honest, we try to stay away from the, the, the colleges that the big four go to yeah. because it allows us not to have to play second or third fiddle. It allows the, um, it allows the professors to get to know us really well. It allows them to say, look, this, this particular candidate would be a really good fit or they're not a good fit. They'd be better off served at a big firm or a small firm. And so um, we are on campus. We're regularly on campus. We're active in the, the beta alpha size of the world, the accounting um, uh, honor societies, and, and, and we do those sorts of things. And we ha our HR person leads that effort, but historically it's been you know partners and managers and staff uh, headed to those events. Um, okay, random question from the audience, um, but but one of our uh, attendees is saying, "I love doing taxes. I'm currently in school, getting an MBA in finance and accounting. I'll be done in six months. Is there a career path where I just do taxes in in, in mid market? Um, that exists, right? You don't have to come in and do uh, work right. on the side if you don't want to. No, you don't have to. No, no, no. No, I mean it. It, it a it depends on the firm, but. They always, I don't want to say always, I want to say 99.9% .9 of the time, will adapt to what the person really wants. If they have a strong affinity for tax, um, they're going to lean them to tax. Now, they might have to do an audit the first year because of staffing need or something, but it's not 50-50. It might be 
you know, percent, one percent. So that um, that's not an issue at all. And and lots of mid-sized firms are significantly more tax driven. What I mean by that is, uh, unlike the big four and those size firms, might where tax is actually a smaller department than audit. That is not the case at any mid-sized firm that I'm, you know, under 200 people, 300 people. All the mid-sized firms have more tax than audit when it comes to uh, hiring. I can remember, you know, when I was at PwC in Boston, we the summer I interned 15 years ago, we had uh, 55 audit interns and nine tax interns. <laughs> that would be the opposite at all mid-sized firms. Right. All right. Um, now a question about we've talked a lot about big four going into mid-market firms. What about Accountants moving from private industry into um, public accounting. So, how can private industry accountants market their skills for small and mid-sized firms? And and how do you approach that, John, when when a candidate uh, comes to you from private industry? So, I I would say this is where mid-sized firms have a, 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 the only advantage. Uh, it's really challenging to go from never working at a big four to go from uh, you know public. For, to go from private into a big four, I would say that's a, you know the unicorn. It's the one in a million. I've never seen it, but I'm sure it exists somewhere. In mid-sized firms, it happens all the time, and that's because we are entrepreneurial. But what somebody learns inside of a company is when they're working for a company, they learn other things. They don't just learn. They they le they might learn a little tax. They might learn a little audit, but they're definitely going to learn a lot of accounting. They're going to learn some HR. They're going to learn some management skills. They're going to learn, you know, how the business runs. That stuff can be very valuable to us to a mid-sized CPA firm because that's what our clients want us to do: is be generalists, not specialists. And so, um, for those folks, we look at those uh, types of lateral moves all the time. So, um, in other words, there's not a bias against you if you come from private industry, is there? No, definitely not. I would, but I would say there is at the big four. There's, I mean, I see, I see some small firms occasionally. People will jump to the really large firms, but I don't ever see anybody leave private who hasn't already been in a public accounting firm uh, jump into a big four. What we hear a lot is uh, people will, will maybe start in public. The grass gets greener, so they go over to private and they get bored. And um, it depends on the company, of course. But a lot of people who are destined for public accounting find that that is that work is not uh, challenging or sort of doesn't have a lot of variety and they, they want to leave. I, I, I hear it differently, Jeff. I hear that a lot when they when I hear those issues, a lot of them have to do with the fact that they're an expense item, not a revenue generator. And for those, <laughs> for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, um, when you work at a CPA firm, you're, you are production. If you think of manufacturing, you are the, you know, the cog that makes the machine grow. You're serving a client, you're billing hours, that generates revenue. You're, you're a profit center, and I mean that in the positive way. I mean, you're helping the company grow in a significant way. If you're an accountant at any private company in the world, you're an expense line. It, uh, they, that's the way they look at you, and so it's a different philosophy. And that's why when you, when you think about your career, if you if you're at two years out, and there, there's a lot of people who are in industry accounting on this call, um, <laughs> somebody just chimes and says, "Oh yeah, I'm so bored, ready to go back to public." <laughs> but um, that's great, by the way. Thank you. I won't I won't mention your name to protect you from your employer, but um, I don't know. I lost my train of thought. I, let, we got to do a polling question real quick. Just one last <laughs> one. We'll sort of wrap up on uh, final thoughts. Oh, this was it. This was it. So you, you get two years of experience in a public accounting firm, then Robert Half comes calling, or the, the employer, you're going to get a 20 to 30 percent bump in salary. Now that feels pretty good, right? Remember, you're a cost center, so compare where you're going to be after 15 years at the, at the hospital versus 15 years at John's firm when you're a partner, and you're, you saw the salary numbers, two, 250 to 520K per year, um, you're a profit center at the accounting firm. Think about what you'd rather be. I've, I've been a cost center, okay? I was in, in HR um, in the software industry, mm -hmm. and then I went into sales where I made money for the company. For me, that felt a lot better, and I had more job security. I controlled my own destiny, so it's just something to think about. Um, okay, so let me ask you guys this. After watching this, this session, are you more interested in working in a mid-market firm um, you can say, yes, I am more interested. I can say, no, I am not. 
or I am less interested or my interest level is the same. Maybe I was, I was interested before. So um, this is cool, guys. So we've got 70% voting. I'll give you five more seconds. Click one, hit submit. But John, um, 60% of the audience are saying that, yes, after, after hearing you speak and with all of your persuasive skills, uh, <laughs> they, they are more interested in working in a mid-market firm. That is, that's pretty darn awesome, I got to say. We'll go ahead and close this up in three, two, one. Here we go. Thanks. Um, let me ask you guys this. So, John, do you know your Twitter handle off the top of your head? Uh, can you give that to me real quick? Uh, I can pull it up if you give me like a second. I've got okay. So just you you find that guys. Let me give you um. Give, let me wrap a couple things up here. At two p.m. Eastern, we're going to be talking to Mark Koziel of the AICPA. He he runs the PCPS Group. This is a collection of seventy five hundred accounting firms that um that are all part of the AICPA. They're our partner on this event. And he's going to sort of wrap up the week by telling you why you should trust your career to public accounting. Um, I think it's going to be a great way to close this session. The, I'm, I'm pulling up my Twitter handle. Sorry, it takes a second. <laughs> Are you going? Hopefully, hopefully, it's hopefully it's where I said it would be. There it is. There it is. So. <laughs> All right, so. I'm putting it in here. I'm putting it in the code here. John Bly underscore CPA. Yep. Got it. The other thing I wanted to tell you guys about before we before we say bye to John is. About 30% of the audience are going to take the CPA exam. Take advantage of this free CPA exam coaching session with Glime CPA Review. Um, it's only 100 seats. It's next Thursday at uh, I believe 1 p.m. Eastern. You, you can click there to register. We're not going to record it. If you do want, if you can't make this, then don't register. If you don't, if you can't make it, um, just email me. Jeff at accountingfly.com and we'll invite you to the next one. But these are small. We want to give you a chance to ask questions of of uh, Amy uh, Ford, who's a professor of accounting at Western Illinois University, and she is fantastic. So please join. Um, John, I think I think we have accomplished our goal here today, which was to present a case for the mid market firm. Um, I think that we we being mid market firms don't tell our story well enough to accountants, especially accounting students and young CPAs. Um, so you've given us a lot to think, uh, to think about. Thank you for being here. Thanks for putting the time in to build this presentation. It, it's a great service that you've done. And I, and I just, I just want to say thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. And as a reminder, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. Um, happy to share ideas and help you out in any way I can. Yeah, and, and, and for those of you who didn't get your questions answered, fire them off to John um, over Twitter. That'll get, make you an excuse to join Twitter if you're not on there because you should be on Twitter. Um, then you can follow him on LinkedIn as well, John Bly, B-L-Y. Um, as we're wrapping up here, I'm just scanning the uh, – oh, when is the drawing going to be? The drawing – the winner will be announced first thing um, Saturday morning. All right. John, we'll wrap up. We're at the hour. Thank you. I appreciate it, man, and I'll see you down the road, okay? Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks to you. See you guys back at 2. Please be here for that. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of Meet the Firms Week. John, we can kill our webcams and um, and mute your speaker because I'm going to leave the webinar open for a few more minutes so people can gather the notes, okay? Yep. Thanks, man.